Well, I would like to welcome the board members and members of the public and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Logan Pitts, the chair of the Board of Community Services and uh, present with us today we have uh, Terry Griffin, uh, Vice Chair Steve Spellman, Carolina Spence, uh, Board Member Carol Quant. Am I, am I missing anyone there? No, great. And we have uh, Shelly McClure today and Jackie Haman is our host. Uh, they will be coordinating the comments and assisting during the meeting and taking notes for any follow up. Panelists and presenters, please silence your cell phones and keep microphones muted if not speaking. Members of the public joining this meeting will have webcams off and microphones muted. If you're phoning in to join the meeting and you choose to speak during the public comment portion of the agenda uh, for privacy concerns, the host will rename you to caller and only show the last four digits of your phone number, uh, but you're welcome to introduce yourself. Additionally, the city of Santa Rosa is committed to providing a safe and inclusive environment, free from disruption, and will not tolerate hateful speech or actions. Everyone is expected to participate respectfully, or if necessary, the meeting will end immediately. Please be nice to each other. Madam Host, will you please explain how public comments will be heard at today's meeting? Thank you, Chair Pitts. At each agenda item, the item will be presented, the chair will ask for board comments or questions, and then at the appropriate time, open the floor for public comments. The host will lower all hands until the public comment items is open. Once the chair has called for public comment, the chair will ask the public to raise their hand if they wish to speak on the specific agenda item. Those joining by phone may dial star nine to raise their hand. The host will then call on those who have raised their hands. Public comment is limited to three minutes and a courtesy timer will appear on the screen. Email public comments received by the deadline have been distributed to the Board of Community Service members and uploaded to the agenda prior to the start of today's meeting. Emails received will not be read into the record. Thank you. Thank you, host. With that, I call this May 25th, 2022 meeting of the Board of Community Services to order at 4.08 p.m. And pursuant to government code section 54953E and the recommendation of the help officer, uh, the Board of Community Services will be participating in today's meeting via Zoom. Board members and staff are participating from our remote locations and practicing appropriate social distancing. And members of the public may view and listen to the meeting as noted on the city's website and on the agenda. Host, may we have a roll call, please? Yes. Please respond when I call your name. Chair Pitts. Yes. Vice Chair Spillman. Here. Board Member Griffin. Here. Board Member, Board Member Quant. Board Member Cruz. Board member Spence. Here. Board member Bacchialonia. Bacchialoni. Again, board member Spent or board member Quant. Are you present? Can't hear me. I'm here. Thank okay, I great. Here. Thank you. I cannot seem to get my video going. Apologies. No problem. We have four members present with the exception of board member Cruz and board, board member Bacchialoni. Okay, I, I believe that'd be five. We'd let the record reflect that five board members are present with the exception of board members Cruz and Bacchialoni. That is correct, thank you for the correction. All right. I would like to open the floor now for public comments on non-agenda items. Uh, this is a time when any person may address the board on matters not listed on this agenda, but are within the subject matter of our board. Host, do we have any public comment items for item three? No. Great, thank you. All right, next up is item four, the approval of our minutes. Are there any edits or corrections to the minutes uh, way back from March 23rd, 2022? Terry, go ahead. Just a couple um, 
of minor corrections. Under um, roll call, it lists the names of staff, but it doesn't list the names of the board members. And I believe board member Cruz was the only person absent um, at that meeting. And then under the nomination and election for um, vice chair, it says uh, board member Spillman was nominated, but I believe it should also say he was elected. So nominated and elected unanimously. So those are my only corrections. Okay, thank you for those, Terry. Am I seeing any other hands up from anyone? No, okay. Uh, we will uh, accept those edits um, as submitted. Th those seem to be minor edits, so I think we can accept those. And we will move on to uh, agenda item number five. That is the upcoming events and reports on accomplished events. Deputy Director Tippetts, thank please you, give Chair. your report. Yes, thank you, Chair Pitts. Um, Unfortunately, Jen Santa, Deputy Director Jen Santos is out today, so you guys are stuck with the B team tonight. Um, but uh, you received, should have received an email with the uh, recent accomplishments and, and upcoming events. A few things I'll highlight and then see if you have any questions on any of the other ones. Uh, June is Elder Abuse Month, so our senior centers will be uh, participating and in, in bringing attention to this. Um, and we'll have flags up in our facilities. I'm pretty sure they're purple is the color for, for elder abuse awareness. So. Uh, that'll be taking place at our senior centers. Really excited to say that we have, it's now up to, it was emailed out as 128, but I believe it's now up to over 130 teams registered for our adult softball. Um, and again, it's another exciting accomplishment of the, the rebuild of recreation programs. So last year when we brought it back for the first time, I believe we had about 80 teams. Um, and now we're back up to over 130, which usually we're in the 130 to 140 range for teams. So exciting that programs are getting back up to full capacity again. Um, uh, note June 10th is the fall 2022 sports field applications due. As we know, we have a lot of people who use our sports fields, so important everyone gets their information for fall usage for June 10th. The fall season field usage begins um, August 1st, 2022. So again, June 10th, those applications will be due. Um, the volunteer program continues to do strong. Um, the uh, and we've got another Parker Month volunteer event coming up June 11th at Southwest Community Park. So, love to see people out there helping clean up the park um, and, and make Southwest Community Park look great. We just had one at uh, Howarth Park, and since we didn't have the last meeting, we had a, a Parker Month slash volunteer appreciation barbecue at Coffee Park uh, the month before. So, uh, attendance continues well at those and, and really getting a lot of work done and making a big difference in the park. So thank you to everyone who has been participating in those. We hope to see you out there June 11th at Southwest Community Park. Um, this one I'm gonna read verbatim because I'm not super familiar with it. So June 15th, South, uh, South Davis Master Plan Update. So the second virtual community meeting for the South Davis Neighborhood Park Master Plan Update Project is planned for Wednesday, June 15th at 5.30 p.m. Survey results will be shared and three park concept plans will be presented. The presentation will be followed by community feedback. So again, we encourage everybody to come and participate in that to have their input, get more information and have their input heard for the South Davis Master Plan Park uh, Master Plan. Also want to draw attention, staff have been letting me know that merit award nominations are a little slower this year than they have been in the past. So I wanted to highlight that July 10th is the deadline for submitting merit award nominations. We know there's still a lot of great people out there doing amazing things here in Santa Rosa. So please, um, seek out the, the nomination form for the Merit Awards and let staff in the Merit Awards Committee um, know about the great things that we're doing so that we can honor those people for the work that they're doing. So please get those nominations in. As far as some accomplished events, another celebration of program getting back up and running our work experience program, which is the teen work experience in the summer, uh, has been down for a couple of years due to COVID. We have over 200 teenagers registered again for this summer. Super exciting to have teenagers participating in a positive activity like that, getting work experience. We're also super excited because that's such a great feeder into our hiring process. And as everybody, recreation is really struggling with recruitment and hiring of staff. And we know that having 200 volunteers participate in that program again this summer 
is really going to be a big step in the right direction for us to get our staffing levels back up in the future. So awesome to announce that. And then also want to let the board know that um, given still the, the, the chaos of bringing programs back and trying to plan budgets and COVID and those types of things, uh, recreation has been trying to prioritize some of the areas where we haven't been able to spend all the funding because not all programs have come back. So uh, if you've driven by Steeling Community Center, you may have noticed that it is getting painted, which is long overdue. So that building is getting a nice coat of paint on the outside. Um, we are working on also trying to get uh, Deterrent Round Barn included in that on this year. Um, and then we also are working uh, with finance to hopefully get a project uh, account set up so that we can use some of those savings in the budget this year to replace the chlorine generation system at Ridgeway Pool, um, which the last two times we have had to get fixed. Uh, we have been warned that it's outdated equipment. There aren't replacement parts for it. We're getting lucky that they're able to keep it up and running. Um, and based off projections, the cost of chemicals now, it's, it's only about three years of us purchasing the chlorine that it would pay for itself. So we're excited that we're able to use some of those savings and get that equipment updated and replaced so that uh, Ridgeway Pool can, can stay open and functioning and safe for the public. So that is all I have, unless there's any questions on any of those accomplishments or upcoming events. Thank you, Jeff. And you're definitely not the B team. You're doing great. <laughs> so thank you for stepping up for Jen. Um, can you also provide us with the director updates? Yes, so a few things for the director updates. Uh, this, is, this is where the B team status for me will, will come out a little bit more. The Brown Act update, I know that the board asked for this. Uh, Jen is certainly more uh, familiar with the Brown Act than I am and can provide more uh, information and answer questions if, there, if it doesn't cover any. But I know that there was a request from the board of why is the city asking um, you to notify uh, the board secretary if you're attending events? Um, and again, it's, you know, the, the, the rule of the Brown Act is written out where uh, there cannot be a quorum that gathers and discusses topics. Um, and so I know some of that question is like, well, if we're not gonna, if we're all gonna agree that we're not gonna discuss topics, then why do we need to worry about not forming a, a quorum at these? And really, right, I mean, the, the Brown Act is intended to protect the decision-making process, protect um, the public's, um, uh, you know, confidence in how decisions are being made. And so um, while yes, there is that caveat in the rule that it is gathering and discussing, obviously the more that we have this board gathering, uh, whether it's discussing you know, at, at a community meeting, for example, the, the master park plan for South, uh, South Davis Park, um, the, the perception could be there that this board is meeting as a quorum and they're having discussions um, and that decisions are being made before it's in a public forum and before public comments are being heard. So that's the reason that we tend to, to try to be a little bit more uh, cautious with that and aware of that and making sure that we're, we're not just following the rule, but we're also the intent of the rule of building that confidence in the public of knowing that um, the procedure is taking place the right way and they're not questioning how those decisions are being made. So um, if you have questions about that, I can try to answer them, but we'll probably defer any further conversation uh, to when Jen is, Jen is back in. Um, again, wanted to highlight the South Davis uh, Park Master Plan um, update in there. I already mentioned, but again, that's Thursday, March 20. Uh, I'm, I'm going to read again because <laughs> I may miss some of the parts that, that Jen put in this one. So um, staff have embarked on a grant funded project to replace the playground area at South Davis Park and engage with the community on what other amenities they might like to see at the park and what interest they may have for additional improvements at the park. Staff have conducted two community meetings thus far. A virtual meeting was held on Thursday, March 24th with 13 attendees, and an in-person meeting was held at the park on Saturday, April 9th with 24 attendees. An online and paper survey was available from March 24th through April 22nd and received 44 responses with 60% of respondents living in the Southwest quadrant. A third community meeting for the South Davis Neighborhood Park Master Plan update project will be virtual and is planned for Wednesday, June 15th at 5.30 p.m. Survey results will be shared and three park concept plans will be presented. The presentation will be followed by community feedback. Spanish interpretation will be provided. The computer lab and the person senior wing at Finley Community Park, uh, Finley Community Center will be open and available for community members to participate in the meeting who do not have computer or internet access at home. Online access is also available at the Roseland Regional Library and the Central Santa Rosa Library. An online survey in English and Spanish will be available for three weeks following the meeting, June 15th through July 6th. 
project info can be found at the Rec and Parks website for park projects. And then the last update, um, as many of you already know, uh, staff would like to acknowledge Stan Go, um, who was a longtime uh, chair of the Board of Community Services and participant with the Board of Community Services. Um, to be perfectly honest, I, I wish there was another staff member presenting while I did have the fortune of uh, interacting with Stan here and there. I know there are a lot of people over the years who, who really built a, a close relationship with him. And um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to build as close of a relationship, but I certainly interacted with him. Certainly uh, know that Stan is one of those community members who was really dedicated to public service and Santa Rosa community uh, and the Santa Rosa staff were, were very fortunate to, that, uh, that he was part of our community and that he made all the contributions that he did. So we wanted to acknowledge Stan um, with his recent passing and also announced um, as it has been requested to be public to let people know that Stan's memorial service will be held on June 19th at approximately 1 or 2 p.m. in DeMeo Park. Um, and so again, I know we, we may address this later on as uh, many of the board members knew Stan very well, um, but on behalf of the city, we wanted to um, acknowledge and honor Stan for all of the amazing work that he did here in Santa Rosa. And that is it for director updates. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate that for Stan. Um, do we have any questions uh, from board members? Okay, uh, we will be moving on then to our scheduled items and we're on item seven, which is our uh, chair slash board member reports. So we only started doing this in March. So I'll, I'll kick it off again, just to sort of remind folks of uh, the format I, I was hoping for. Um, so we're basically just giving an update on what we've done uh, as board members uh, at the intersection of, of what we oversee of the Board of Community Services. So uh, for me, that would be attending the Howarth Park cleanup um, a few weeks ago. Uh, definitely one of our lower turnouts, still good, but we did have a special guest. The city manager did show up and uh, did a great job raking leaves. So we always appreciate any, any extra help. And uh, it was good to talk with her for a while. We also had a uh, design review board member, Mark Stapp with us. Um, so that was great to see. And the other thing, um, that uh, I was hoping folks could do is try to go to a new park once a month and then report back on which park you visited. Um, so that's my challenge to everyone. And uh, I kind of went, I went a little crazy on that. I went to five parks, we've had two months. So I went to five new parks, um, Skyhawk, Danehauer, I think that's how it's pronounced. Um, Finale Park, I uh, went to South Davis Park and I met with a planning commissioner, a commission member and then today I had lunch at Colgan Creek Park and uh, there must be a GPS tracker on my car because two of those times uh, a maintenance staffer showed up right when I did and started cleaning the park so that was great timing good job staff um, the parks looked great um, so I wanted to let anyone else give an update and then I wanted to save the last update uh, for Carol uh, if this is a good time Carol for you to speak more about uh, Stan Gao if you want to do that. Uh, so anyone else, uh, I'll just call on folks. If you have no update too, that's okay. Um, we'll go first to our vice chair, Steve. Any update this month? Any report, Steve? I'm just uh, continuing a, a couple of things. One is uh, working on a potential uh, donation of land for a city park. It's still confidential. And uh, working with uh, Councilwoman McDonald uh, she has a lot on her plate, being the, the new kid on the block, so to speak, uh, kind of filling her in. And we're discussing uh, goals for uh, the Board of Community Services for her district. Thank you for sharing your long experience in city government with, with the new council member. Um, Terry, any reports from this month? Um, yeah, I attended the Coffee Park uh, Volunteer Appreciation event on April 9th, which was wonderful, a great turnout. Staff did a phenomenal job um, encouraging local high school students to come and, and get their uh, community service credit. So we had a fair number of high school students in attendance. I was really happy that we did this particular park in April because it was all about the weeds and the ground was still forgiving enough. They were easier to pull, um, but we made uh, incredible 
a headway on the uh, weeds and coffee park. So that was a really fun event, which our city manager also attended as well. And then I um, visited uh, also South Davis Park, which I had never been to even after working downtown so many years, but um, it's just a little drool tucked away in that. Sorry, oh. I lost you. You lost me. Here we go. You're talking about In South Davis. Way. Oh, do we do we still have Terry? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead, Terry. Okay. So yeah, that's all I had to report. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It is a lovely park. Carolina, do you have a report from this uh, from these last two months? I, I should probably tell everybody that I've got a GPS on you, Logan, so I know where you are. So it, don't, don't worry about a thing. You're doing a really good job at going to see parks. I did take a spin over by Doyle Park, um, park because I love that little park. And, you know, it is, um, it's looking much better. And, and I'm grateful for that. I know that's a work in progress. And I, I can see that. And, but I'm keeping the hope alive on that one. And thank you again for the update and poke about the merit awards. Uh, I am chair of that committee and we are really, really encouraging people to send in awards. It's a fabulous program and you're not going to, you're gonna hear from me a whole lot before it's over. Um, so pl um, please think about submitting a nomination for someone or if you need any information please please feel free to reach out i'm very happy to help we appreciate you taking the lead again on that carolina thank you carol do you have a report yes first i'd like to let everyone know that stan is laughing at me right now um, because I am having such challenges with my video, having just upgraded my operating system. And um, I don't know if I'm using as many four letter words as Stan would, but Stan and I are having a wonderful time trying to get my video to work. Do you see my still picture, anybody? Yeah? Do you see, can you hear my voice? Yes, we can cool. hear you, but we can't right. see you. Works for me. So, um, yeah, um, we'll start with Stan uh, because, he, because he is so present in my life. Um, the thing at DeMeo Park is scheduled for two on Father's Day. Um, it's a real neighborhood event. I have no idea how many people are gonna be there. The video, the slideshow that's being put together, um, which goes back to Stan's um, childhood, let's just say I got to cry already by seeing the pictures. So uh, Stan's gonna stay with me for the rest of my time on this board. And I hope he stays with a couple of other board members and some staff because he was um, larger than life. And he uh, is skiing somewhere right now in heaven. So putting Stan aside for a second, um, I was at the uh, coffee park with Terry. I got to pull some weeds with our new city manager. I, um, I was at, I don't know if it's park, I was visiting a, a green space on the Santa Rosa Creek Trail out in Rincon Valley, which is uh, coming up before the Waterways Committee tomorrow. So visited a green space this morning and um, did my first uh, stint as a docent at the Rural Cemetery for the sold out uh, dark side tour, which was the night of Friday the 13th. Uh, we had a lot of murders and suicides and gunshots and the hubbub band. And it was a glorious uh, night uh, under an almost full moon. If these things interest you, there is another, this is my promo for the Rural Cemetery. There's another night event coming up. It is Lamplight, two nights several spots still available in the middle of September. Also, we are doing Memorial Day tours 
next Monday. Um, we will have the flags up and um, be providing walking tours to anyone who comes by and there's no sign up required. Uh, last but not least, I also attended a couple of South Davis Street um, park meetings and um, we'll stay tuned on that. And I think that's about it. Thank you, Carol. Especially appreciate you letting us know about Stan's Memorial. It's very appropriate to be in a park, a beautiful park. All right, we are gonna move on to agenda item eight. Uh, this is uh, item 8.1, excuse me, the Measure O update and public education outreach. Uh, Scott Alonzo and Deputy Director Jeff Tibbetts are here to review the public education outreach material and garner feedback from us uh, for the potential ballot measure for November, 2022. Scott and Jeff, it's all yours. Thank you, Chair Pitts, and good afternoon, board members. And we have other city staff here as well. Uh, we have our fire chief, Scott Westrup, our police chief, John Cregan, and our community engagement director, Magali Teas. Uh, so all of us are here along with uh, Mr. Tibbetts. So we're gonna present a, a short PowerPoint. I know I think some of you have already seen it. So, um, but really we're here to uh, share with you uh, information about the dedicated sales tax uh, known as Measure O. Uh, and garner feedback from you uh, as the city council potentially um, weighs that uh, for potential ballot measure this November. So we're uh, here tonight talking about maintaining public safety services um, in Santa Rosa. So next slide, please. So just some background briefly on Measure O. Uh, it is a quarter cent sales tax that was approved by the voters in Santa Rosa in November of 2004. Uh, it received 70.2% of the vote uh, and 29.8% uh, of opposition. So it passed, uh, it needed a two thirds vote uh, to approve because it's a dedicated measure uh, which has specific expenditures uh, and funding buckets that we'll, we'll talk about. Uh, the tax is approved for 20 years and so that tax will expire in March uh, 31st of 2025. Uh, Measure O provides dedicated funding for violence prevention programs and public safety. And there's a specific uh, city ordinance that outlines what the expenditure plan is for this money uh, that the city council uh, put on the ballot back in the summer of 2004 and subsequently has updated the ordinance, I believe twice in terms of the expenditures. Uh, next slide, please. So the expenditure plan has very specific uses, and because it's a dedicated sales tax, the money has to go to these specific uses. Um, so for instance, 40% uh, of the money goes to Santa Rosa Police Department that's raised by this tax, and the police department can spend that money specifically on patrol, traffic control, gang enforcement, school resource services, and bicycle patrol. And subsequently, the measure, all, the expenditure plan and measure discuss that police specific services can also be used in Railroad Square, Prince Greenway, and downtown, in addition to uh, police support services. So, for instance, civilian positions within the police department. The other 40% of Measure O money can, for, is for the Santa Rosa Fire Department. And the Santa Rosa Fire Department can hire firefighters and paramedics, construct or relocate fire stations and purchased specialized equipment. And so we'll hear more from Chief Westrup uh, about that in a few moments. And uh, last but not least, 20% uh, of Measure O funding uh, goes to our violence prevention programs, including programs within the Recreation Division. So we'll hear also from uh, Jeff as well. Uh, and so that's part of our neighborhood services programs, uh, but also in addition uh, for violence prevention, that's their entire team. So violence prevention program uh, helps run uh, multiple grants to nonprofit partners, which is part of our choice grant program, uh, which uh, our community engagement director will discuss, uh, and also goes to violence education, prevention, and social services. So in addition, there's also youth counseling, mental health services, all part of that funding that violence prevention does. So next slide, please. And now I just want to turn over to our uh, police chief, uh, John Cregan, who's here this afternoon, and he'll uh, go over the impacts of Metro funding for the police department. Thank you, Scott. And thank you, Chair Pitts, for allowing us to come together and speak with you and your board members today. 
So for the police department, Measure O is a critical part about uh, our department being able to sustain uh, our safety measures here in the city of Santa Rosa. We actually have 16 funded positions of full-time employees with the Measure O. There are 11 sworn uh, officer positions and five civilian positions. And the officers are dedicated to a variety of positions, uh, including some of the enhancements to our police department, such as our motorcycle officers, which are focused on traffic safety. And uh, we've already seen five fatal collisions so far in 2022, which is disturbing to us and dozens of other serious uh, injury collisions. And these motor officers are dedicated to those investigations and to uh, provide some of the traffic enforcement to reduce more of those collisions from occurring. We also have our downtown enforcement team and they work specifically in our downtown core, but also spread out to address some of the homeless related issues and other uh, uh, areas of concern that we have citywide. We have uh, five patrol officers and these patrol officers are assisting us with our response times, but also assisting in large events, such as we're coming up into wildfire season and Chief Westrope will tell us with a host of the dangers that we all know too well here in our community with the wildfire uh, seasons, but the police department's role in that is evacuations. And we know how overwhelming that could be. And it's very resource uh, intensive, those evacuations, especially when we're evacuating entire east sides of Santa Rosa, some of the, these larger events. We have um, a lieutenant who runs our special events and our traffic division. And then we have field evidence technicians, which process crime scenes. We have a community service officer, which responds to uh, uh, non-suspect reports, like with burglaries, with uh, uh, no injury vehicle collisions and a host of these other things. This year with Measure O, we're looking about how we can expand and we're responding to some of the community feedback. So we added two new intern positions, which are gonna be focused on community engagement. And we're also looking at some equipment with, we're getting, uh, we're focused on being transparent as our agency and hearing some of the concerns from our community. So we're adding a new Axon fleet system, which is a camera system on our patrol vehicle. So it has forward facing camera, side facing camera and a camera and the rear passenger area of anyone being transported in a police vehicle. So those are gonna be important for accountability of our staff, transparency to our community, and for protection for our city and for the community members who come in contact or are near any of our vehicles. Uh, we're very busy. So right here, it talks about in the slide in 2020, which is the last year data for that. We saw over uh, 203,000 calls came in and out of our 911 dispatch center with 72,000 of those calls plus were emergency calls to our uh, 911 center. Um, and for us, it's really important to be able to see that. And we've seen, unfortunately, some of our calls for service creeping up. Uh, we measure what we call a priority one call, and that's an emergency call for service needing immediate assistance. And it taking uh, right now, our average response time has creeped up over seven minutes to so seven minutes and three seconds. So that's important to us to be able to put the resources there to get that call uh, response time down and Measure O plays such a key part about that. So I, I just want to, to say that, but also to say it's not just about the doom and gloom about some of these things. Measure O is assisting us with some of the community engagement, with some of the equipment we need to better serve our community. We're looking at using Measure O in the future to do uh, great community engagement uh, areas like building a Roseland substation. And that's one of my top priorities right now to build a substation in Roseland have bilingual and bicultural staff that be there to have a front counter, be able to take reports, have material there in Spanish. And that's something that we're looking for a building now and seeing if we can find something that fits within our budget. So those are some of the key like summary of what we're doing with Measure O. But what I can say at the end of the day, it's a critical element of the Santa Rosa Police Department's budget. And uh, we would feel significant impacts without Measure O uh, continue into the future. Next slide, please. And I'll turn it over to Chief Westrow. Thanks, John, and uh, good afternoon, Chair Pitts and members of the board. Scott Westrow, Fire Chief of the City of Santa Rosa. Um, and like John talked about, Measure O is pivotal to the fire department, and I'll explain a little bit as to what that means to us. Um, but just some background, the Santa Rosa Fire Department in calendar year 2021 ran 28,000 calls for service, um, just over 28,000 calls uh, a year for service. We typically see a two to three percent increase in our call volume on an annual basis, uh, so we will most most likely breach thirty thousand calls for service this calendar year. Uh, about sixty five percent of our calls are emergency medical service related. You might hear me use the term EMS. Uh, essentially, all of our apparatus have paramedics on board. Uh, we're trained to a minimum of EMT, but uh, we provide the higher level of service as paramedics. And we do that with a staff of 148 personnel across three bureaus. 
um, in operations, which are the boots on the ground um, out providing this level of service to the community. Uh, we have about 123 in operations. Um, on top of our call volume, uh, we also complete about 30,000 hours of training per year, uh, completed 3,200 fire inspections uh, between operations and prevention, and completed 13,000 weed abatement inspections last year. So for Measure O, quite simply stated, uh, it can be broken into to three different buckets for the fire department. It's personnel, facilities, and equipment. So on the personnel side, we have 10.25 FTE or 10.25 bodies assigned to Measure O. That's three captain paramedics. So that's the frontline supervisors on our engines or trucks, three engineer paramedics, which are the apparatus operators, three firefighter paramedics, uh, which are, they ride in the back seat and do a lion's share of the work. And then also all of our truck companies, the big long ladder trucks that you see, they're paramedic equipped due to Measure O as well. So there's six additional paramedics. Um, their pay is tied to Measure O. Our training captain, which runs our recruit academies and the training facility on West College Avenue is Measure O funded, as is a quarter of our EMS battalion chief, our emergency medical services battalion chief. Uh, as far as fire station goes, um, Measure O built station five on Newgate, which unfortunately we lost in the Tubbs fire, uh, station 10 in the Southwest where I'm at, and station 11 in the junior college district. So um, it built those three stations. Um, we still have money that is um, being generated in Measure O right now to build fire stations. The unfortunate situation we've run into with uh, building fire stations with Measure O or any other funding source is the construction cost of far outpaced what the revenue for Measure O uh, produces. So um, we look at a figure of $15 million or so to build a fire station. So um, it's outpaced it, but it does provide us the flexibility to be able to purchase property like we just did for the new station eight um, or to do some enhancements or improvements uh, to our current facilities. And lastly is the equipment. Um, we purchased type one fire engines, which are the fire engines you see on a day-to-day -day basis responding to um, all hazard emergency events. Uh, type three fire engines, which are the wildland specific firefighting engines, uh, swift water equipment and training. Uh, to increase us to a type two swift water team, um, which purchased command vehicles when we expanded our command vehicle fleet. And most recently we used Measure O to improve our communications infrastructure in that we're putting in dual banded mobile radios in all of our equipment. So we can talk not only on our frequencies, but on law enforcement frequencies. So as John referenced, when we're doing large scale evacuations or we have incidents where we're in unified command, we can be on the same frequencies and the communications break, don't break down. On top of that, um, we also have uh, that's coming with that package is mobile repeaters. So we can use our vehicles as repeater sites. So when we have a line of sight uh, tactical channel in use, we can now repeat it. So some of the communications failures that we saw in our radio infrastructure during the Tubbs fire um, is being repaired now via Measure O funds. Um, so it's really pivotal to us. Those are the three main things that run the fire department is the people, the facilities, and the equipment. And so Measure O is, is vital to us. And just to put it on par and, and to equate it, it takes nine people for us to staff a fire station. Three people on an engine company for three shifts is nine people. So if we were not able to fund those positions in another way, it equates to the loss of an entire fire station worth of coverage. In the city of Santa Rosa, we have 10 fire stations that are strategically located throughout the city. So you can see it would be a significant loss if we were not able to find another funding source for those positions if Measure O was not to be extended. Next slide, please. And with that, I will turn it over to Director Tance. Thank you so much, Chief. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Magali Tellez, uh, Director of Community Engagement. Uh, so I'm just going to give you, share the stage here with um, Jeff Tibbetts, and we're going to start out with talking a little bit about the Violence Prevention Partnership arm of this. And uh, so the Violence Prevention Partnership is a collaborative effort of over 50 organizations focused on strengthening youth and families and creating safe and resilient neighborhoods through various upstream approaches. Uh, some of our partners include schools, superintendents, local healthcare providers, nonprofit organizations which address rental assistance, childcare, and much needed services um, and access to bilingual and bicultural mental health providers. 
the idea that there are deep-rooted issues under our social problems, which include poverty, lack of access to resources, and historical systemic racism. Um, these deep issues have been at the forefront for the Violence Prevention Partnership and our operational team, who are boots on the ground folks. These are our community agencies that we partner with. This morning we met uh, to not only discuss what the themes and trends have been in our most vulnerable communities, as well as a great discussion of what the current pro-social activities are that are available for youth this summer. Through the Violence Prevention Partnership Policy Meeting, we create common understanding of the core challenges that our youth are experiencing today. One of the topics at the lead of the and of part of the multiple conversations that we're having in the community is schools uh, with schools and nonprofit partners are around how do we compete with gangs from an upstream approach? Which agencies and programs can we connect youth to that combat the deep need for mentorship, activities, and belonging, which are some of the fundamentals that gang life are offering our youth? For parents, we connect them with specific parenting programs, which are culturally relevant and provide resources and services to assist parents who have children who are gang involved or gang interested. Much of our work is framed in the understanding and research that provides that our most vulnerable families have poor access to health and mental health services. And to some extent, violence has been normalized and prevention services overall as a community, um, well, there aren't enough. And um, as many, many of you may be familiar with the Youth Truth Survey, um, which was a collaboration between Career Technical um, Education and SCO, found that youth themselves are saying that they need social emotional support. So the Violence Prevention Partnership is able to work with our nonprofit partners through our wraparound service coordinator um, and our multiple agencies to connect referred youth to uh, this much needed um, support. The Violence Prevention Partnership um, in the last two years has been working in coalition with our local partners to assist uh, and provide our communities with, with access to some of the our most basic needs like diapers, food, gas cards, mental health services. Um, in addition, we focus on the understanding of a trauma-informed approach uh, when working with community. So um, to talk a little bit more about um, how we also do this in the recreation side, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. Thank you, Magali. Um, so yeah, so Neighborhood Services is a section within the Recreation Division, and it focuses on operating the programs that are funded through Measure O. Um, as I continue, we, we've done this presentation uh, to different groups, and as I continue to think about it, and, and what's the messaging, it's I found myself stuck in this. We're trying to tell the history of it while we're also trying to look towards the future and, and what measure we'll do in the future. So I'm going to try something a little bit differently here in, in this presentation, and hopefully it, it tackles both of those. So one of the things I thought about is with, with neighborhood services and Metro funding, telling you what the programming is really depends on when I'm having a conversation with you. So for the first six to eight years, um, Measure O programs through neighborhood services were very uh, emphasized traditional after school programs. We were at eight elementary schools. We were at two middle schools. Um, we had our neighborhood based programs through Burbank housing sites. Um, and so that was really the, the, there were other programs that we ran in the summer and different things, but that was really the root of the programming. Um, as you may or may not know, after school for the need for after school programs is something that politically has gained steam over the last couple of decades. Um, it has gained more funding sources and with more funding sources means more providers. Um, and so in that 2010, 2011, 2012 range, uh, we started realizing that there were other funding sources that could meet that need. There were other providers that could do some of those services. And so neighborhood, uh, neighborhood services programming step more towards some of the extracurricular activities. So junior warriors basketball program, neighborhood services cheer, neighborhood services dance, uh, flag football programs, um, programs along those lines to, to add services to the community um, instead of competing for you know, services that there are other providers to meet. Um, at that same time, we, we expanded some of our community programming through that and family programs having, um, you know, family dances and the spring fest um, for families to get together and celebrate and do egg hunts and face painting and, and those types of events. Then obviously here recently, we've had another drastic shift where as you can imagine, a lot of those programs I just mentioned, sporting events, community events, um, summer programs, 
became a challenge to offer and the need for the community changed as schools were closed. And so Measure O was a huge funding source and a huge reason that we were able to offer our distance learning assistance program where we had over 100 kids Monday through Friday for the entire school year um, from 7.30 to five o'clock at night. Um, and again, not to something that I would have ever presented as what Measure O is going to do, but as the community need changed, um, we had this, uh, you know, it is a very dedicated funding source and that it has to be used a certain way, but it, it's very unique in its flexibility to be after school programs, summer programs, a distance learning program, if that's what it's needed, um, family gathering events, uh, all those different types of things. So it really is something uh, that uh, I am very fortunate to stand here and talk about these things and represent an incredible group of talented and passionate and creative staff. Um, and when they're backed with a funding source like Measure O, um, we have seen for close to 20 years now the creativity and the way that they're able to provide services for the kids. Um, and, and in terms of looking at the future and support for, for funding, it is, I can't sit here and tell you what those programs are in 2024, 2025, 2026. What I can tell you is that the component of those programs are going to be focused on giving children a safe place to be, um, giving children positive adult role models. Miguel, he talked about competing with gangs. One of the things to compete about with gangs is giving kids a place where they feel like they're welcome, giving them a place where they feel like they belong, um, having things like teams, you know, sporting events with teams, um, after school groups, summer camps, those types of things where these kids feel like they belong, they're building their self-esteem. Um, again, I, I don't know what the program model is next year, uh, let alone 10 years from now, 15 years from now, but those are the, those core focus that we're going to do to make sure that we're providing good prevention programs. And then the last piece of what we're going to be providing is it's a very unique way with a safety net, not just to serve the kid that's in the program, but these kids follow through multiple programs. Our junior warriors, right? It's multiple ages. So you, you build relationships with that kid that leads to building relationships with the families finding out what their siblings might be going through. And then as Magali talked about with the Violence Prevention Partnership, a big piece of serving these kids is not that one person has the answer for everything. It's that we are a community that needs to work together. And Neighborhood Services has a very unique opportunity to serve a lot of youth, to build a lot of relationships, and identify when a child needs services um, that go beyond what we're offering. And so working with Magali and her team, working with the Choice Grant um, agencies, working with the Violence Prevention Partnership, to get those families that need additional services. So we're catching them with that safety net early on and keeping them engaged and getting them in the programs that they need. Um, and so that's kind of where we are with neighborhood services and the focus of Measure O. And Magali, I don't know if you had something to add on after, but. Sure, I just, I just wanted to give a little bit more background. Uh, so back to the choice um, grantees, they are doing a phenomenal job um, despite everything that's that's happened in our community. I just wanted to share um, some of their successes, so which we're seeing in our reports. Um, so one of our, our funded programs is LifeWorks of Sonoma County. We fund a mental health program called El Puente, and we found that 93% of participants that we serve through that granted program showed a reduction in risk-taking behavior like gang involvement violence and substance abuse. And another example via the REACH program, which is another one of our choice granted programs, um, is actually housed at the juvenile hall and 99% of the youth who participated avoided incarceration while enrolled in that program. So I just wanted to make sure these are just two of the agencies that are helping, you know, as part of that coalition to really make a, a collective push um to work with our youth and as jeff said create that sense of belonging uh because we we are up against uh, a number of challenges um so that is the end of uh of my piece so we can go to the next slide thank you uh magali jeff and and the chiefs for for that information and, and overview um so when we talk about measure of funding and, and the expiration you know, each year the city uh, that that fluctuates depending on how much sales tax revenue the city of Santa Rosa receives. But currently, it's approximately ten million dollars a year. Um, and so, if the, that funding were to go away, we could see layoffs potentially uh, within our fire department and police department, as well as service cuts uh, within our recreation division. And as I mentioned earlier, the the entire violence prevention program team is funded by Measure O. Um, and as Chief Westra mentioned, the necessary staffing. 
uh, requirements for a fire station. Um, so we could see impacts there in addition to emergency response times and how, uh, as Chief Cregan mentioned, the priority one calls to respond to urgent medical needs or violent crimes, all those could be impacted um, with potential cuts uh, without Measure O. Uh, next slide, please. So if Measure O were, were to be renewed, um, we could see the reduction of um, the, the risk of wildfires by improving wildfire prevention, preparedness, early fire alert systems, rapid response and evacuation planning. We could maintain our fire protection services and prevent the closure of any stations. We can maintain our rapid 911 response, provide resources for youth and their families, such as those violence prevention efforts and along with those choice grants to local community-based organizations. And we can lastly prevent any reductions with Measure O funding in the number of on-duty firefighters, paramedics, and police officers. Next slide, please. So as part of uh, the current Measure O sales tax, there is an accompanied uh, Citizens Oversight Committee. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that. Um, and each year, uh, they actually publish a really informative report to the community. Um, and actually, I have a copy of it right here. Uh, you can read it on our website. It's uh, a lot of information there. Uh, it reviews all the funding that goes in, the, the taxes that come into the city, what it's spent on. Um, and so there's, with that, mandatory financial audits and so back in uh, December, that report was published uh, for, for the community. And the, the oversight committee, uh, we presented to them back in April, and they traditionally meet every quarter of the year. All the money raised by uh, this uh, sales tax would be controlled locally um, and restricted for those uses only related to public safety or violence prevention. No money could be taken away uh, by Sacramento or diverted for other purposes. No money could be used for any sort of city administrator salaries. And essential purchases like groceries and prescription medicine would be exempt from the quarter cent sales tax. So it's not an undue burden on those on limited incomes or fixed incomes. And last slide, please. So really, we wanted to present this information to you because the city council is going to consider uh, on July 12th uh, whether or not to put a new ballot measure uh, for this general election in November of 2022. So the city council is going to be considering a number of factors such as, does the tax go on this year? Do the allocations change, right? So right now it's 40% to police, 40% to fire, 20% to violence prevention partnership. Um, and so the other item that would be under consideration is how long would the tax potentially be for? Right now, Measure O is a 20 year tax, uh, but certainly the council will have that discretion uh, when they consider it in July. So part of our uh, community outreach efforts is to hear from community stakeholders and neighbors and local businesses about currently what measure, what measure O is doing and potentially what we could see in the future for Measure O. So we would like to take this opportunity to answer any questions and really hear feedback from you and the public uh, who are attending tonight. Um, and we are gonna present that information to the council, like I said, in a public meeting on July 12th. So with that, that's the end of our formal presentation and we're happy to, to dive in. Thank you, Scott. And I'll make sure to actually introduce everyone correctly. So that was Scott Alonzo, our uh, new intergovernmental relations and legislative officer. So thank you, Scott, uh, for leading that. Uh, we also had our fire chief, Scott Westrope, our interim police chief, John Cregan, and Magali Teas from the, the director of the Office of Community Engagement. And of course, our own Jeff Tibbetts, deputy director of recreation. So thank you everyone uh, for that. Um, we're gonna go to questions from the board uh, and also just want to point out that board member Guido Boccalioni is present. Guido, thanks for, for being here. Um, so we're just going to do questions right now, board members. Uh, we'll do our own comments after public comment. Um, so if there's any technical questions for the presenters, um, please raise your hand, board members. Uh, looks like Carol has a question. Go ahead, Carol. Uh, thanks. Uh, sorry, I can't get my video up. Can someone from staff tell us what the current um, add on taxes are from the city of Santa Rosa, their percentages and when they expire and what they add up to? Well, let's do city and county as a whole. I saw we're at 9.5 currently. I can be corrected. It looks like we're about midway um, for cities in the state of California with a low of close to eight with a high of well over 10. 
Um, what are those add-ons? What are they? Ex when do they expire? Uh, just to get a, a feel really for where this is in the bigger Santa Rosa city tax picture. Thank you. Yes, uh, board member, we, we don't, I don't have that information on my fingertips, but we're happy to follow up with our finance team and, and get that to you. And we can follow up with staff to ensure that the full board uh, has that information. I know at least Santa Rosa has at least one general sales tax measure that was approved by the voters, I believe in 2020. Um, but I don't recall what the expiration date would be on that. So, but we can, we can follow up. And I did have one other question, if, if you would indulge me. I know that this tax essentially fully funds the special recreation programs, which are targeted to at-risk youth. Approximately what percentage of the police and fire departments are funded by, um, by this? It's been termed supplemental funding. And um, from your presentations, it seems very important, hardly supplemental at all. Uh, Chief Cregan, do you want to go first on that? Absolutely. So for us at Get So Far 22-23 uh, upcoming fiscal year, we have $4.2 million. So it funds the 16 funded positions out of 249 full-time employee budgeted positions that we have. I don't have the actual percentage in front of me uh, that it has, but it's the 4.2 million for 16 funded positions. And then really a focus is going to be on some of the enhancements we're getting for some of the uh, equipment, whether it be the, the fleet system that we have, whether it be the roast and substation, whether it be some of the other like costs that are things that are kind of one-time monies that are enhancement to our department and helps us provide a better service to our community. Thank you, John. Chief Westrope, do you have a... Yeah, absolutely. So uh, for the fire department in the current fiscal year that we're in right now, our general fund budget was 45 million and our measure all allotment was just over 3 million. So um, if I'm doing the math right, it's about 15%. But again, we have a staff of 148 and it pays for 10 positions um, out of the 148. Thank you. Uh, Director Teus, do you have an estimate in your department um, what measure all covers? Well, I, I do want to highlight that um, of the 20%, we get 35% um, of that funding also goes to fund the choice grantees. And then the rest of that we split um, between recreation and um, really just essentially the salary for our, our uh, community outreach specialist. And I don't have, I may have cleaned my desk, so I don't have that exactly, um, the exact numbers. So I don't know, Jeff, if you have any of that information, but I will, I can make sure to get it over to you because I want to give you exact numbers. Thank you. You read my mind. Jeff, do you know the percentage in your department? Uh, I do not. Um, I'd have to, to look that up because it is, um, it's, it's broken into a section of recreation and obviously operates a little bit separately. So um, there is, so part of measure M is, a, or measure O, excuse me, has the uh, baseline requirement. So there is a baseline of general fund that existed um, prior to, to the measure. So there are some, uh, some contributions to the, the, those programs that is general fund, um, but the, the majority of the programming that is designated as the, the violence prevention programming, gang prevention programming, um, it's, it's definitely the vast majority of it is, is uh, I would guess it's about 80% um, measure of, but I can get the exact numbers on that. Thank you. Another question, Carol? Yeah, I just want to say those generalities are good enough for me. Do not go digging on my account. You guys have more important things to do. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Any other board members with questions for our presenters? Not seeing anyone else, so I'll, I have a few. Um, John, I'm curious, do you, is the in response program um, that comes out of the police budget, is, does Measure O contribute to that at all? It's not currently contributing, but I think what Measure O, especially going forward, is gonna help in response be sustainable. So right now, the first, uh, for the first 10 hour model, so it's 10 hours a day for seven days a week, was funded $1.1 million out of the general fund from the city. 
We now have a little bit of a bank of some money from the American Rescue Plan Act and from a federal earmark that we have. And that's gonna fund the team for about the next two years, right around the time that Measure O expires. So Measure O really will be important to the sustainability for this team for the future, especially as we get to a full 24 seven response model. So would the current language allow you to spend funds on in response if the sales tax is renewed with the exact same language? It not with the exact same because right now it's saying for police patrol services, police traffic control, gang enforcement, school resource officers, bicycle patrol, downtown, railroad square, Prince Memorial, Greenway, police support services. So I don't I don't believe that in response would meet the definition of this. And we may get some like maybe a legal opinion from our city attorney on that, but it wouldn't be a straightforward. Uh, but what I do believe strongly is that by allowing this $4.2 million that fit, uh, like supplies some of these core services and some of the enhancement of the police department, it allows the city to have the budgetary uh, options to be able to continue an important program like uh, in response. And it's so important to me and Chief Westerope and so many others that help led the creation of that team to make sure it's sustainable for the future and that in response is here for decades to come. Okay, thanks. Another question for you, um, it, since it funds downtown operations, um, it seems like we've had more people downtown in the past few years as we've seen the new Courthouse Square, which is great. It's a, it's a parks property, so we love seeing people there. Have you seen the costs for that part of your department uh, rise or, or even the needs, maybe not the costs, but the needs? We certainly have seen the needs and we get lots of calls from our downtown business owners about wanting more of a presence. But now we have, uh, like just today, the Wednesday night market kicking back off. And so we have our dedicated downtown enforcement officers. They're there at no charge to the downtown merchants or to the uh, Wednesday night market. Our downtown enforcement officers are putting more of an increased presence to make sure that uh, for the protection of our community members there at that large event, but also for calls that spill into our local businesses. But we certainly are seeing the impact, but honestly, it's spreading citywide. And as we see not just some of the criminal behavior, but then we see now in the adjoining area of downtown along the Prince Memorial Greenway and in some of the other areas that go out there, we certainly seen an increased calls for service in those areas. Okay, thank you. Um, one other question, and then I'll get to you, Terry. Uh, uh, Chief Westrope, you brought up the inflation issues. Um, Maybe this is too wonky, but is that going to make it hard to estimate um, what you'll be able to purchase? Sounds like your equipment costs have, have gone up pretty fast. Yeah, the equipment costs certainly have gone up. Um, we put a two to three percent, you know, the essential CPI escalator on all of our equipment. Um, and what we saw this year, we just bought two Type One fire engines. We we leased them. Um, um, and so we were able to get in before we were notified that there was going to be an inflationary increase to that equipment. So we were able to get in contract before then. So um, we've just upped our upped our escalator to try to estimate it. It's it's just like anything else. You know, we can't estimate necessarily what fuel prices are going to be or what um, you know vehicles are going to be, much less capital you know fleet. So um, we have just recently deployed, and it'll be in this fiscal year's budget, a capital fleet replacement program. So um, hopefully that everything that we have now um, will have the funding going forward to replace based on this system that we put in place for the first time ever. Um, so we can control the cost there. And then as we look at specialized equipment, we'll know, you know, that's the thing with Measure O. It's specialized equipment. So we'll we'll know at the time what the costs are going to be before we get into contract on it to make sure that we have the funds available out of Measure O to, to purchase those things. So um, yeah, the supply chain's tough and inflation is tough and it's, you know, it obviously is, it's on scale. So whatever um, you're purchasing at home and we got to buy it bigger, it's, it, it raises the price more. So we're doing the best we can at that. It's just, it's just hard to budget right now and on the equipment side of things. Okay, thank you, Scott. Mm -hmm. That's it for me. Terry, do you have any questions? Yeah, just to clarify a quick question. So um, what, if the ballot, if the measure were to go to the ballot this year or 24, whenever, is there anything that would preclude um, the city from uh, changing it such that the services that could be provided or, or targeted with the funding could be broadened, just as Chief Cregan mentioned on the inReach support services? So in other words, could the, could the measure be updated and worded in such a way that those services could be covered or any other services that the city deemed appropriate? 
Maybe Hi. Scott. Yeah, go ahead, Scott. Thank, thank you. Yeah, through Chair Pitts. Thank you. Um, yes, Board Member uh, Griffin. The all, all options are on the table for the council, so they will deliberate in July. The the staff recommendation will be a, a renewal of what currently is in Measure O, but certainly that's just a baseline starting point. So there'll be, I, I would imagine, a robust discussion uh, over some of those questions I had mentioned earlier about what what would the allocations be? Would the tax increase? Right, right now it's a quarter cent sales tax. The council can, cer can certainly consider all of those options uh, in July. And so that's why it's so important we hear from, from folks like you all and other community members about what they would like to see for the future um, of Measure O. And one other quick question, if I may, Chair. Um, of course. Has the city done any polling on the renewal of Measure O at this point? Yes, uh, thank you for that. Uh, we have done, uh, in addition to a public opinion survey, we did our first one last fall. And um, as part of that uh, effort, we've also sent out some direct mail pieces uh, to voters in their mailboxes. Uh, we are gonna conduct a second poll uh, right after the June 7th election, um, in addition to a few other mail pieces. And in addition to all of that, uh, in it, with these community presentations, we're also uh, hosting with city council members uh, some virtual and in-person town hall meetings in June. Um, so folks can attend either in person or by Zoom uh, to weigh in on that. So we're trying to get as much feedback as possible. Uh, but yes, we have done some polling and uh, we'll do another round uh, as a follow-up uh, in early June. Thank you. Uh, on that, will the polling be part of the public record in the presentation to the city council? Yes, we have a, a consult, an outside consulting team um, for this uh, public education initiative. And so they will present with staff on July 12th. Um, so that information uh, will be part. I'm not sure how much of it in terms of the, the finished product, we'll, we're still working on that. But yes, the, the results will be discussed uh, for the council's consideration. Great, thank you. Uh, another question from Carol, go ahead, Carol. Yeah, um, so I have both of the um, 1117 um, education pieces. That's what they're being they're being called. The, the pieces that were sent out on Measure O. Um, I take it those were not funded with Measure O money. Those were funded out of some other um, department. I also did the survey that popped up in my computer today. And so I also attended um, one of the first public meetings at Santa Rosa High School. It was very interesting. Um, how's the public engagement going or is it too early to really tell? Thank you, uh, board member for that. Yes, uh, we did see you at, at the meeting uh, back in April and um, we did, we're doing uh, more robust uh, outreach for those town halls in June. Um, so we're, we're excited about that. Actually, our, our town hall on June 1st will be completely in Spanish uh, in Roseland with Vice Mayor Alvarez. And then we're going to conduct other uh, town halls throughout the remainder of that month. And folks can get that all that information. And we can provide that to the staff to send to the full board uh, on the city's website. And it's srcity.org uh, backslash measure O. And so that has information about uh, the the town hall meetings that we're going to do in June, as well as, as you mentioned, that online community survey that we also have in English and Spanish. So uh, we're encouraging folks to fill that survey out. Um, but to your first question, none of the Measure O monies were spent on the public education initiative. That's from a separate um, allotment uh, that the city council approved back in March uh, of this year for a contract with our uh, outside consultant. Okay. Thank you for enduring our, our intense round of questioning. Um, do we have any last questions from any board members? All right. Well, we are gonna now check and see if we have any public comments. Uh, host, do we have any public comments on item 8.1? No, uh, there are no hands raised at this time. Great. Uh, so now that we've gotten through those, uh, we're going to go back to the board for discussion. So this is the, the commentary point. If you want to, you know, uh, offer a comment or suggestion, um, as Scott said, they're looking for our feedback on, on how to make this better. So 
I'll open that up to the board. Any comments? Terry, go ahead, please. Well, I just want to thank everyone for the presentation um, and for uh, really giving us the detail about how Measure O has impacted each of your departments. I think it's important, and you've done this already with us, but um, going forward with the public to really tell stories um, about the impact Measure O has had uh, on the lives of Santa Rosans. I mean, it's great to have the data but um, the individual stories, whether it's from uh, choice grant partners and people that have participated in those programs or after school programs um, or new equipment in the police department and how that's impacted um, the operation of that department in providing public safety. I think it's important to tell those individual stories. We had a young man come to this board a couple of months ago that had been through um, the after school programs that offered by Measure O. And his story was so compelling, it was very inspirational. So, to the extent that we can do more of that, that would be great. So, thank you so much for the presentation. Thanks, Terry. Uh, any other comments from board members? All right, I'll, I'll uh, offer some comments. I'll, um, I'll just echo what Terry said. I think that's a really great point, Terry, that um, sometimes we can get lost in data and uh, PowerPoints. And I think it's really good to tie that to real life experiences. Uh, like we heard, like Terry referenced from a young man whose life had been changed. Um, I was on the Mesero board for almost four years. So I'm pretty familiar with a lot of those stories, um, but I think that they need to be told more. Uh, so I, yeah, definitely want to underline Terry's point there. Um, I also, uh, to Chief Krieg and I, I hope that in response is added to Measure O. Um, I'm not the police department budget expert, but I think from a political perspective, from a public relations perspective, that's probably a very popular program. And, uh, you know, maybe not everyone knows about it yet. So let's get more people to know about the good work and in response. Um, and if you can, if you can get that name recognition up and get it actually into the ballot description, um, I see that as a positive all around. Um, and I understand what you're saying, how it, how it gives you a little more flexibility with the rest of the budget. But I would just say, me personally as a voter, I'd love to see that program have a, a dedicated funding source for whatever time period uh, the sales tax is renewed for. Um, I also appreciated uh, Magali uh, some of those statistics from the violence prevention program. Um, I don't remember it being that detailed when I was on the board. That was a while ago. This was almost six years ago now. But um, I really appreciate that detail uh, about, um, and again, let's tie that to a real life experience. But um, those statistics uh, were pretty powerful. So I'd really um, encourage you to, to compile those and, and to get a face to them. Um, and then uh, my one uh, piece of constructive criticism is on the PowerPoint. Um, I think that saying that it's not an undue burden on low-income folks is definitely debatable. Um, there's a lot of research that shows sales taxes are disproportionately paid by low-income folks. It's, it's a greater share of their income than, than higher earners. Um, so maybe I'm just quibbling over the word undue um, but I think uh, there's there's no reason. I mean, I guess you're anticipating a criticism of a sales tax, um, but I think that's getting a little wonky. I don't know that most people are, are going to debate tax policy. Um, so I would just disagree with that description of it. Um, I, I know politically that's the easiest way to raise revenue. And in California, we have a very uh, convoluted system for doing that. Um, so you're, you're doing what is probably most likely to pass. I get that. Um, and yeah, those would be my comments. I really appreciate um, all the presenters. Oh, Carol, yes, please go ahead with some comments. I'm gonna hold off for a second because Carolina's been waving her hand. Oh, I'm sorry, Carolina, I missed your wave. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I, uh, I wanna emphasize what you just last said. It's very hard to, to pass a tax. You know, people look at it as a tax, 
these have been hard times and people are going to go right to that. I would like, I, I think the PowerPoint is really good. I would like to suggest that you go to every service group, every nonprofit you can go to to get on their board agenda and show that, be sure to show that whole scenario and have a couple of people and preferably one with the story, like Terry said, because there's, you know, over 400 nonprofits. Um, you got a chance to meet people who vote. And I would strongly suggest that you do that because everybody, the minute they hear that, what I have heard is their, con their concern is they hear the word tax. So um, I would like to strongly join in on being sure to um, have a story and, and absolutely use your PowerPoint, which is very effective and very clear and even leave them a copy of it, you know, so they can use it themselves. Thank you, Carolina. Sure. Carol, go ahead. So I look forward to going to another one of the live um, interactions. I think that is really the best place where the human beings who are doing the presenting have the opportunity to tell the stories and make it more about people than just about um, the tax because everybody's gonna be calculating what this is gonna take away from them under tough times. Um, the other thing, plain and simple, we've had it for 20, you want it more. This isn't a tax measure, this is a tax increase. It's not going away. And um, if I look at it like that, put those dots together, everybody else is too. So the real question is, is our tax base and I'm also not a one, is our tax base ever gonna catch up with our needs or are we gonna run at a deficit forever? And we have to have these very various supplements. We've got one on parks, countywide. This one is for fire and police. This is reality. Is this just where we are from here on out that there are gonna be these additional taxes put on to make up for the difference in what we do not have in our city coffers? Thanks, Carol. Um, yeah, that's that's a tough that's a tough debate because since Prop 13 passed, we've seen local governments scramble to find new ways to fund themselves, and you really you can draw a direct line from that to a lot of these issues. Um, it, it sometimes took decades for them to shake out, but um, yeah, it's it's definitely a, a, a good debate to have. How do we tax ourselves? Um, so it's, it's maybe the oldest debate in government. So um, appreciate those thoughts. Did any of the presenters want to comment on any of that or answer any questions? You did a great job. So no, don't feel the need to do that. Thanks, Chair Pitts. Just real quickly uh, to some of the comments. If uh, what, I think what we'll do next steps is uh, I'll email the staff to share the town hall information for June, our June town halls. And then in response to that, if folks have suggestions on groups or neighbors or neighborhood associations that they would like us to come out to, please let us know. We're open to it. We've uh, presented, I think this is our sixth public meeting we presented to. We actually have another one tonight at six um, and a few more starting in June. So we're trying to ramp up and talk to as many people as possible in person or virtually. So uh, we're very open to those suggestions and happy to meet people where they're at. So in English or Spanish. So. Great, thank you, Scott. Yeah, I really appreciate the Spanish language town hall and more. the more the merrier when it comes to public outreach. So good job on that. Um, sounds like you got a lot of work ahead of you. Um, so thank you for coming and presenting this to the Board of Community Services. Uh, and with that, thank you to everyone, to all the presenters, you did a good job. Um, we hope to see you again. So uh, with that, we will move on. Um, to the next agenda item, which is committee reports, uh, item 9.1. Uh, that would be an update from the mayor's lunch. That's a quick one because it got canceled. Um, they were in the middle of their budget workshop, so the, the mayor was busy with that. Um, uh, Carol, 
you you hinted that a little bit, but do you have an update from the waterways committee? Uh, waterways, we did not have a meeting last month. Um, I can tell you that um, the city uh, staffer has moved forward with an agenda item that we weighed in on, which was the replacement fencing uh, at Prince Memorial Greenway for the uh, Hyatt Hotel. And um, my sense of the waterways board was um, to move it further away from the creek and it did get moved further back. So that's the good news. Um, also, there was a ribbon cutting for a stretch of the Colgan Creek Reach, which I will describe as behind South of Fern Avenue and east of Elsie Allen High School. So, would you say that's pretty, were you there, Logan? No, but I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I think you got the geography right. So um, well attended, well planted, lots of natives, um, goodly amount of city staff. And um, one of those, a long-term investment from a lot of agencies throughout Sonoma County that has replanted essentially a culvert, a drainage ditch into what is going to be a wildlife accessory that serves a very important purpose in um, potential flood control if we ever have rain again. So that was uh, last week. And tomorrow we are meeting on another project which has to do with um, another commercial building going up along Santa Rosa Creek. And um, land very close to the creek is being built on. So we get to weigh in on that. That's about it. Thank you for that update. Yeah, the Colgan Creek project is very important for that neighborhood. Um, I'll embarrass him slightly. So the mayor in these strange times, that was his first ribbon cutting, even though he's been the mayor for about a year and a half. And he was so eager to do it, he actually broke the scissors. Um, so he's gonna go fix them in the wood shop. Um, <laughs> but he was out there for that. It's a great project. Um, so thanks for that update, Carol. Okay, uh, back to Deputy Director Tibbetts for agenda item 10. Do we have any written or electronic communications, Jeff? Um, so you were provided the, the Zest newsletter, which is the uh, senior, senior newsletter that goes out to our senior members um, for the March, April, May, 2022 newsletter. And I'm seeing nothing else. Great, thank you. Uh, on to agenda item 11. Uh, this is our future agenda items. Does anyone have a desire to see anything on a future agenda? Um, anything you want to explore further or ask questions about? Carol, go ahead, please. I think this may be taken care of at the next Zoom meeting um, for South Davis Park, but to get some survey results from the community outreach survey that took place on South Davis and also the Fremont Park Master Plan. I think that extended survey has also closed um, uh, some information on the status of that project and specifically the survey and whether the staff has the information it needs to move forward. Great, thank you for that. Good suggestions. Um, anyone else with any future agenda items? Uh, one, uh, Jeff, that I was hoping to see uh, would be an update on the city's uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative. Um, we, I think I brought that up at a past meeting that I think all the boards are getting that briefing and we got it at, at the charter review is the first uh, board or commission to get that. So I'd like to get that to BOCS uh, in the next few months so we can learn what the city's doing there um, and, and all about that great program. Uh, that was it for my future agenda items. Uh, any other thoughts from any other board members about future items? Make sure I'm not missing any waving hands here. No, okay. Um, great. All right, well, with that, we are gonna adjourn this meeting and I just wanna, um, the next meeting of uh, the Board of Community Services will be Wednesday, June 22nd at 4 p.m. And I also wanted to adjourn this meeting
um, in memory of our former chair, Stan Gao. Um, Stan, uh, his wit and wisdom will stay with us. He had a big impact on this board and on uh, the city. And um, thank you, Carol, again, for sharing your thoughts and uh, the information on his memorial at, at the Mayo Park on Father's Day um, at 2 p.m., I believe you said. Correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, and so with that, I would like to adjourn this meeting in memory of Stan Gao. And with that, I adjourn the meeting at 5.30 p.m. Thank you, everyone.